Just a quick warning, there is so much information about the Arduino code in this video that you could pretty much build your own machine like this one after watching it. So if you're not that interested, I've made a shorter video on the same machine, but without the technical stuff. You can check that out. What the hell? This camera is so clear. I wanted a machine to solve a Rubik's Cube using an Arduino because from what I know, it's the simplest and easiest type of microcontroller to code. I didn't think it would be too difficult, and it turns out it wasn't very difficult, it just took a really long time and a lot of money. From start to finish it actually took over four months, but I'm really happy with the result. There wasn't any particular reason for making it, it's just what I'm like. I'm using an Arduino as the brain of the machine, which if you don't know what that is, it's a very simple microcontroller that you can write and upload code to using a computer which is then carried out by the Arduino by switching the pins between 0 and 5 volts. For the machine to solve the cube, the Arduino needs to know the starting position of all the colours on the cube. It also needs a way of turning the sides. So the most obvious thing to begin with is motors and colour sensors. I started by just buying stuff and testing it, playing around with it to see if it would work on the cube. First thing I bought was a colour sensor. There only seemed to be one affordable colour sensor that I could use with the Arduino easily, so I bought that one. Here is the colour sensor. It has LEDs to light up the colours and 64 photodiodes in red, green and blue. It works by converting light intensity into a frequency which can be read by the Arduino. By activating different combinations of the pins, the individual colours can be read and used to work out the colour of an object. It can be directly wired to the Arduino like this, which is how I'll be testing it. First, the sensor pins are attached to the Arduino pins. The pulse width for each colour is defined as an integer and the pins are defined as inputs and outputs. Setting S2 and S3 to low sets the red photodiodes as the output and the pulse in function reads the length of the pulse width. This value is then displayed onto the serial monitor to check what the sensor is reading and then the process is repeated for green and blue. Every colour produces different responses from each photodiode, so by reading the combinations of red, green and blue for each colour, the Arduino can be told which colour it's facing through code. Since the light intensity fluctuates constantly, there are slight changes in the output signal, so the Arduino will be told that a given colour will have a range of values from each photodiode. Having recorded the ranges of responses from all the colours of the cube, the code can be written to read the colour and display that colour on the serial monitor, using if loops and specifying the ranges of responses for each colour. Calibrating this sensor was really tricky, because I found that very small differences in ambient light changed the frequencies enough that they didn't lie in the range of frequencies I'd set. I had to play around with the ranges and increase them as much as possible so that they could work in rooms of different brightness. But it's finally working and I'm happy with it. Now I needed to find the best way of turning the sides of the cube as accurately as possible. The best options seem to be either servos or stepper motors because they both have positional control, but a servo is limited to 180 degree range whereas a stepper motor can keep rotating for as long as you want. Many of the algorithms to solve a Rubik's cube require the sides to be turned to more than 180 degrees, so it was best to use a stepper motor. The only problem is, they tend to be quite expensive. I bought two of the cheapest ones on Amazon and tested them to see if they could turn the sides of the cube fast enough. Motors draw a much bigger current than an Arduino can typically supply without damaging itself. So when using an Arduino to control a motor, you need a motor driver, which draws its power directly from a power source, but still receives a signal from the Arduino which it uses to control the motor. The first stepper motor I bought was very small and relatively cheap for a stepper motor. This particular one is commonly used with small projects because it draws small amounts of current and it's simple to use. It came with a driver, so I didn't have to worry about checking the specifications before testing it. I quickly 3D printed a part that would connect the motor shaft to the side of the cube and put it on the motor. It worked smoothly, but it wasn't quite strong enough. It would sometimes get stuck, which would mess up the whole cube solving process. I tried connecting it to 12 volts to see if it got any stronger, but after it stalled with 12 volts, the current got too high, damaged the driver, and it stopped working. The other stepper motor was significantly more expensive, but was stronger and faster. However, it didn't come with a driver, so I bought the A4988 driver, which was designed for a range of different sized stepper motors. As a result, I had to adjust it to provide the correct current to the motor. This driver had a voltage range of around 8 to 35 volts, so I could use the 12 volt power cable, but I had to buy a couple of adapters that would connect the power cable to a breadboard. The motor and Arduino could be connected in parallel across this breadboard, because the Arduino has a voltage regulator which can handle up to 12 volts. This way they can both take their power from the same source but draw different currents, so every component is safe. The driver activates a step of the motor every time 5 volts is applied to the step pin. Therefore, the time between each step pin signal corresponds to the time between each step, which is the time taken for the shaft to rotate 1.8 degrees, since that's the step angle for this motor. The direction of rotation is simply determined by the value of the direction pin. A for loop can be used to turn the shaft by any desired angle, because it repeats a section of code a specified number of times, in this case 50 times, which is a quarter of a turn, and the code within the for loop simply turns the step pin on and off. The delay between each high and low signal determines the angular speed of the shaft, 
and the quickest delay for this motor is about 500 microseconds. The final delay is for how long the motor remains stationary after every quarter of a rotation. The motor should not be connected until the current limit has been set to prevent the components from overheating. To set the current limit on the driver, the potentiometer on the top must be turned to a specific angle. The voltage across this potentiometer and ground is proportional to the current limit through a relationship found in the datasheet for the driver. For this motor, the voltage must be around 0.5 volts. Now, with the driver set properly, I put the purple attachment on the shaft and plugged the motor in. I started it at a low speed and it worked well. The torque of a stepper motor decreases with RPM, so keeping the speed low keeps the torque high. Although, I wanted the cube to be solved as quickly as possible, so I tried increasing the speed of the motor, but I noticed that sometimes it wouldn't turn exactly 90 degrees, which meant that it might be missing some of the steps. This was probably because it didn't have enough torque. Also, ideally, the motor should have more torque than it needs, just so any small accidental jams don't affect the performance. I bought one more bigger motor with four times the torque and tested it with the same circuit and setup as the previous one. It was perfect, easily strong enough and really fast, so I ordered five more of them. However, the power cable I was using had a current rating of 600 milliamps, which wasn't nearly high enough for six stepper motors, so I had to find a new cable. The only cables that could handle high currents were quite expensive and had very specific specifications, so I ended up getting this. It's a switching voltage converter, and all it does is convert the 240 volt AC main supply into 12 volt DC, and has a maximum current rating of 21 amps, which is more than enough. I had to make a plug for it though, because it didn't come with one, which I thought was a bit strange, but it wasn't hard. The voltage converter required fork terminals, which needs to be crimped onto the wires. Another problem is that each motor requires a number of signal wires from the Arduino, which means the Arduino doesn't have enough pins for all the components. The biggest Arduino board that I know of is the Arduino Mega, which has 54 digital pins, which would be perfect, so I bought that as well. Ah, good coffee. These components will be connected in the same way as before, with the motors and the Arduino connected in parallel, taking their power directly from the source, which is connected to the top two rows of the breadboard. I will only use the motors in single phase full step, so each motor needs just two signal wires connected to the Arduino, one for direction and one for speed. Now that I had the main components that I'd need to build the machine, I began a design for the frame on a software that I was able to use for free through my uni, called Autodesk Inventor, which is so incredibly useful for 3D printing and generally useful to just visualise designs and make sure they fit together. I made all my parts in CAD or took them from GrabCAD. I wanted to start the chassis with a really simple frame that I could add components to bit by bit and write the code alongside it. I did it like this because it would be really difficult to write all the code in one go, and I also wanted to test the code on the actual cube as I wrote it, so the design started with a frame onto which I made attachment for the big stepper motors. To have enough space to insert the cube between all the motor shafts, they would need to move outwards, so I had them mounted on bolts, which could be turned by a motor, to shift them inwards and outwards. These bolts are connected by gears to spin exactly the same speed and in sync with each other. The voltage converter, breadboards and circuitry could attach to the side of the frame with nuts and bolts. Since I had tested the smallest motor earlier, I decided to use this one to turn the bolts because they were really cheap. These ones needed four signal connectors from the Arduino because their drivers aren't sophisticated enough to directly engage each coil inside the motor, so the Arduino does it. In this setup, I'm using this, which is a breadboard power module. It's the exact size to fit on a breadboard and has 12 volt voltage regulator so it can be used to directly power the Arduino and 5 volt motors in parallel. Luckily, there is a library in the Arduino software which has been created to easily control this motor called stepper.h. This code just rotates the shaft one rotation and then back again. The number of steps required for a full rotation and the pins to which the motor is attached are defined, and then the speed and angle can be written in the loop section. These are added to the wiring diagram like this, wired in parallel with the Arduino after the 5 volt power module. Now at this point, I hadn't actually included the colour sensor in the design, because I wanted to test the motors on their own first, and I was going to temporarily use buttons to input the colours but I realised that because the colour sensor was so sensitive to changes in light intensity, it would be helpful to have these buttons on the machine anyway, in case the colour sensor didn't work, like if it was too dark or something like that. The buttons can be easily wired up to the Arduino with pull-up resistors, which basically round the binary value that the Arduino reads to high or low, preventing it from picking up ambient signals and accidentally reading a high value without the button being pressed. Thanks to my mate Aaron from Swansea, who told me about that because I had absolutely no idea what was going on. When using the built-in pull-up resistors, there's no need for any resistors connected in series with the buttons on the breadboard, and this internal resistor is pulled up to 5 volts, so the button must be connected to ground. Therefore, when the button is pressed, the pin reads the value of ground, which is low, and when the button is depressed, it reads high. 
I had six buttons, each representing its own colour. I also included a little board for the buttons to sit on in the design. The first difficulty I had was getting the Arduino to wait for the user to press the button for continuing. I spent ages thinking about this, but eventually I came up with a way of doing it using the while loop, which executes a single section of code continuously until a condition becomes false. By making the statement, if all buttons are not pressed, and leaving the loop empty except to reread the button conditions, the Arduino will keep doing nothing until any button becomes pressed. This code succeeds in making the Arduino wait for the user to press the button, but it doesn't actually register which button has been pressed. Luckily that doesn't matter, because the Arduino has a clock speed of 16 MHz, which means it has 16 million clock cycles per second. This is much faster than anyone can press a button, so when it's pressed, it won't be depressed until long after the while loop is finished. Therefore, a series of if statements can precede the while loop, which check which button is pressed. A delay has to be put after these if statements to give the button time to be released, so that the Arduino doesn't immediately run onto the next bit of code and assign the same button to the next square. I repeated this code for the next few squares, but noticed that this amount of code already took up 14% of the program storage space, and I needed to repeat this 54 times to do every piece, and then write more code to solve the Rubik's Cube. So I made my own function, which kind of acts like a URL link, so that when the Arduino reaches the function, it gets taken to a section of code elsewhere, which it carries out, and then returns to the same place in the main code. The benefit of this is that since that bit of code is needed for every single square on the cube, it can be called 54 times rather than writing it out for every single square. I uploaded the code and tried the function for the blue face. It worked really well, much better than I expected it to. This is the diagram so far, with the buttons included. This is everything that's needed to solve the cube, so now I can combine all the codes for each component into one giant code to solve the cube. I started by only writing the code for the white face to make sure that it all worked before spending ages on the rest of the cube. This already took over 2,000 lines of code, so I made this diagram to clearly show each section. I began it by defining every position on the cube as an integer, using the center pieces as positional references. These positional references refer to the piece that would be in that position if the cube were solved. So the first position I defined was this square, the white color on the red and white piece. This position is called lowercase wr followed by an uppercase w, the lowercase letters representing the piece which is the white and red piece, and the uppercase letter representing the face on which the square is sitting, which is the white face. All 48 pieces are defined like this, so any position can be written using just three or four letters. Next, all the buttons and motor pins are defined. There is one motor per cube face, which is one motor per color, so the step and direction pin for each motor are labeled with each of their colors. Then the stepper library is included for the small steppers, and their pins are attached. I realized that because all the small motors will be doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, they can all use the same digital pins on the Arduino, so I only attached enough signal pins for one of them. In the setup section, the buttons are all defined as inputs with pull-up resistors, and the motor pins as outputs. I've tried to keep the loop section as short and clear as possible, so that troubleshooting the code is as easy as possible, so after the simple if loops to retract and contract the motors, I've made a function for allocating colors and a function to move each piece into its solved position. These are enclosed in an if loop which only starts when the user presses one of the color buttons. The button color allocation function actually calls another function, which does the actual button reading, for every single cube position. This is to avoid cramming all this code into the loop section, which would make reading and understanding the code much more difficult. The button reading function uses the while loop, like before, to wait for the buttons to be pressed and then uses if statements to assign colors. Once this has been done, the code moves on to the actual solving part. The Arduino doesn't actually solve the Rubik's Cube. I didn't know how to do that. So I've done it in a way that took absolutely ages, but it should hopefully work. Which is to use if statements to check the color of every piece on the cube until it finds a given piece, at which point it carries out a set of rotations that I have told it to move it into its solved position. So the first piece I decided to solve was the red and white piece, which needs to go here between the red and white center. A series of if-else statements are carried out which compare the value of every piece to the red and white piece, one by one, until the values match. The code within each of these if statements is customised to move that specific piece into its solved position. Let's say that the red and white piece is here, in the red-blue position, where RBR is red and RBB is white. To move it here, the red piece needs to be rotated anti-clockwise by 90 degrees. So in this if-else section, I have called the function which rotates the motor on the red face anti-clockwise by 90 degrees. The code within this function is the same as before, where the for loop activates 50 steps of the motor, rotating a quarter of a rotation. However, I've included one final function at the end, which reshuffles the colors after every turn. 
After each rotation, 20 squares will have changed colour, so the Arduino needs to be told the new colours of these squares. Now I can manufacture it. I originally intended to 3D print all of it, but it wouldn't fit on my printer bed and I didn't want to split it up into chunks to print separately, so I went online to find other people who could print it for me. However, I then realised that because they were all sheets, I could just get them laser cut, which would be cheaper and easier, because I'd only be using 2D files. I grouped all the part files together in one file and emailed them to various companies online to get a quote. I ended up choosing a company called LaserLab, primarily because it was the cheapest I could find, but they were very quick and the parts arrived just a few days later. I needed to print some of the complex parts with supports that can easily be removed afterwards. The motors had really long cables that I trimmed down by cutting and crimping the ends with female jumper attachments. And now to test it! However, after assembling the whole thing, there was a problem, which was that the shaft cube attachments jammed the rotation so much more than I expected. And by this point I'd been working on this for a couple of months and just wanted it to work, so I decided to make attachments with two parts, where a piece is glued onto the actual cube and enables the motor shafts to easily lock on without jamming it. Nice. After days and days of troubleshooting the code, I tested it again. And here it is. Yes! The solving time really depends on the starting configuration of the cube, but it takes around 20 seconds on average. This is pretty good, but it seems quite high considering how fast the motors turn. The limitation is in the way it's coded. It solves the cube by arranging each piece in the same order every time, which means that if there's a quicker way of solving it, it doesn't know what that is, so it just does it the long way every time. The total cost of the project was a whopping £277.19 in total. <sighs> However, this also includes parts that weren't included in the final design, like motors that were bought for testing and colour sensors and stuff. I want to find time to make a second one because it could be better, I think. There could be sensors, there could be faster code. So, hopefully there'll be a part two.